Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Hoffman, the Director of the Graduate Programs in International Affairs. Thank you for joining us today at this grave moment as the people of Ukraine face a brutal act of aggression. Uh, this armed conflict has raged since the 2014 seizure of the Crimean Peninsula and the attempted secession of the Donbas region in the far eastern part of the country. In the process, uh, over 14,000 people have been killed, 30,000 have been wounded, and 300,000 uprooted. Over roughly the past eight years, there has been intermittent fighting and cyber warfare, but the eruption of a full-on war as of February 23rd is a most tragic and dangerous development. Russia has amassed over 200,000 troops and is now unleashing its powerful arsenal on Ukraine. The Ukraine military is far smaller, but thus far it is held on, maintaining control of its major cities. In just under a week, there have been 100, perhaps 1,000 casual, new casualties. Almost 700,000 people have become refugees, and another 200,000 at least are internally displaced. Some estimate that the numbers could reach as high as 5 million refugees in the coming month. Frankly, the situation is overwhelming at many levels from the on the ground local traumas being experienced by the Ukrainians to the geopolitical dimensions of great power struggle. From the impacts to the so-called rules-based international order to domestic turmoil for Russians opposed to the war. Today's session was organized by the Graduate Programs in International Affairs and the Global Studies Program with an eye towards bringing light to different angles and perspectives on this conflict. It is not to presume that we have all the answers, but to look at aspects that we are following, questions that we're asking, analyses we are considering, and ultimately to try and fathom what is at stake. The commentators for today's session are firstly, uh, Nina Khrushcheva, Professor of International Affairs and Contributing Editor to Project Syndicate. She routinely provides analysis of Russia and issues of propaganda. Her most recent book is the 2019 in Putin's footsteps, searching for the soul of an empire across Russia's 11 time zones. Thank our you, second, Peter. Our second speaker is uh, Jessica Pisano, uh, Associate Professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research. Her research focuses on politics along the Ukraine-Russia and Ukraine-EU borders. Her soon to be released book is Staging Democracy, Political Performance in Ukraine, Russia and Beyond. And then third, Everita Salina, Assistant Professor of International Affairs. Originally from Latvia, her expertise spans the European Union, human rights, genocide, migration, and international law. Before we begin, I ask that you please be respectful of our speakers. Please keep yourself muted. After an initial set of comments and discussion among the panel, we will have a question and answer period during which time I invite you to write questions in the chat. So let's begin. Uh, I will first turn to Nina Khrushcheva to ask her to share her insights on Russia's strategic culture. Nina, how is the conflict understood in Russia? What is the Russian view on means and ends in the security of the country? Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, for a long time, uh, Russian civil society, political, um, political, the aspects of political pluralism, the independent media, it has been a death by a thousand cuts. It wasn't interrupted. Some outlets and some possible voices were remaining, but were increasingly, increasingly um, shrunk and, and shattered. And just a week ago on the 22nd, the 23rd, it was like a knife to through the Russian heart, essentially. Um, it seemed that uh, until then, and I was one of those people who argued that, that since invasion of, not only invasion of Ukraine, but full blown war in Ukraine was so much against Russia's strategic interests and Putin never showed, I mean, he has been adventurous and you mentioned Crimea and uh, the um, self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Luhansk that were uh, taken away from Ukraine uh, by the separatists. But these were all sort of parts of careful gambling in a way. So he wouldn't bite more than he could chew. They were in 2014, they all these predictions how he was going to go on Kiev. And of course, that never happened because 
it's understood that you really cannot occupy uh, a country full blown because that would be the price, price would be enormous. And so until last week, I and many others um, argued that this just cannot happen because it goes against everything that uh, Putin is known for as a very careful tactician, a very careful planner and sort of rational and calculated of how much he can get uh, via uh, as little as he can spend. So then we were all, and I've been doing mea culpas everywhere for, you know, basically on Wednesday, it turned out that it is, it is indeed a full full-blown war. And most Russians were, like me, completely stunned and shocked and, and couldn't believe that suddenly the country that was uh, certainly not a paradise of human rights and in many ways were a horrible uh, place where human rights were um, were prosecuted. I mean, there's a case of a uh, um, uh, lawyer, the anti-corruption lawyer, Alexei Navalny, should give everybody pause and it was widely covered here. So Putin goes after his enemies. If he goes after his en enemies, he goes hard. But still, I mean, why would you want to occupy a country knowing that sanctions are coming uh, as a hard iron curtain very quickly and very, very immediately? So for about four days, there was kind of an idea that maybe it was just once again, some idiotic negotiation tactic on a Stalin proportion, but it turned out not. And Putin is not, instead of backing backing out and backing out of this and trying to kind of settle it a little bit. Uh, in fact, there's even more escalation. I mean, the shock about two days ago was when uh, he declared that the Russian nuclear force is going to be on on uh, uh, on ready, which is so it wasn't tense enough. So let's just use the nuclear weapons to add to the horror and the drama of it. Uh, and of course, Russians were who absolutely. I mean, they woke up on Wednesday. I think it was when the, the at five o'clock when Putin spoke about the uh, about the. It wasn't even. I mean, another thing, of course, it was. Uh, and I've said it before, it's almost like Orwell got back alive and we are 1984, but on steroids in a sense, because this is not, it's not called a war. It's not called an invasion. It's called an operation, special operation against denazification, which doesn't exist. I mean, this word doesn't even exist. Uh, and against genocide in Donetsk and Luhansk. So supposedly you're going, if you're so concerned about those self-proclaimed republics, why are you in Kiev? Why are you entering Lviv? Why are you going? Uh, why are you bombing Kharkiv and other cities? But Russians are not supposed to know this. In fact, there was immediately an order that you are um, uh, you you have to cover. I mean, Russian outlets have to cover only what the Russian state tells them uh, in in language. So war is peace, ignorance and strength, and then basically like that. So that was the beginning, but there was still some outlets. I mean, there were giant protests that were uh, going on, or giant. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people uh, protesting. They were quickly arrested, and yet they continued to uh, they continued to speak. I think one day at the beginning in, on February 24, I think about uh, thousand and a half people were arrested and then they just the rest continue. But now we are not even knowing how many are arrested because that information is also forbidden. Then uh, the next step that the few outlets were remaining, such as Echo Moskvi and um, and Dosh uh, TV, Echo Moskvi is the Echo of Moscow, which is an independent uh, radio stations like NPR uh, here, close to NPR here, and Dosh TV was a rain TV, so they also uh, tell a story both from Ukrainian side and uh, and the Russian side. So that was potentially, um, and people were watching, there were millions and millions watching them trying to get the information. Uh, of course, they also, because we Russians have numerous relatives in, in, in Ukraine. So there's a lot of information going on, what is bombed, what is not. So it was very hard to keep intact. Uh, and people were speaking out. Uh, some some uh, artists were speaking out. Some, um, uh, of course, the sanctions concerned great amount of, of the oligarchs and, and uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So they were speaking out, but there were of course some who said, oh yay, let's just do this because the West is out to get us. So let's just go and get the West, uh, get the West out of it. So a few days ago, uh, now if you speak 
uh, not the sanctioned way about the um, uh, about the invasion, about the war. It is a 15-year treason sentence. And as of this evening, so because it's now evening in, in Russia, earlier this evening in Russia, both those independent TV, Rain TV and Echo Moskvi, they were closed because they were accused of terrorism and they were immediately, they just lost, uh, they lost their signal, the websites were taken down. And I think Facebook uh, that presents some other forms of information is going to be next. So uh, what, is happening is there the question is how much Russians will be afraid to speak out how mu- Russia how much Russians are going to be afraid to go out and protest because they're losing jobs they're losing contracts uh, they are losing um, uh, they have now permanent record of this and uh, whether it would be enough uh, to feel shame because a lot of Russians do feel, I'm feeling an incredible amount of shame for what's happening because this is, well, a brotherly country, obviously, the country of the same proto-state, uh, the Kiev and Rus, but also something that Putin has been saying uh, that we are, we are one nation, essentially, and yet uh, this is the country that fought in World War II, and Putin keeps talking about World War II is the point of reference for this. And so now uh, the country that was the um, uh, was the defender of Europe in World War II, that is Russia or the Soviet Union, uh, with Russia at its center, the Kremlin at its center, now bombing a country that the, uh, that's also many of people there also speak Russian, the country that they fought together against the Nazism in World War II. And um, I have a friend who used to uh, serve uh, after, you know, after the university, he served in high Kiev as a um, kind of the, the training, the military training as all boys did in, in USSR. And he served next to Kharkiv. And he said, well, we were, uh, when I was serving there, we were uh, training there. We had all sorts of scenarios to look into. And he said, none of the scenarios we looked into was the one that the enemy is speaking Russian. So Russia is now in a giant turmoil because Ukraine, as horrible as it is what's happening to them, they have the whole world behind them. They'll survive, they will soldier on and they will be helped and uh, um, uh, they will be better for it. But for Russia, it's the end. It really is the end of Russia and the world as we as we know it. Because um, even if the military operation ends, which Putin doesn't seem to have any inclination to do, so I actually don't know. We can talk about it later. What's his exit strategy to this? How is he planning to get out of this at all? I mean, does he plan to occupy Ukraine? Really? I mean, that's you know, which occupation ever works well for anybody. And he he is such a history buff. So supposedly he should know this kind of things. So uh, Russia is that uh, darkness at noon moment, is the moment of, of uh, uh, really being completely cut out of, of uh, the world community. We are the enemies of, of the world. And every Russian now is being considered uh, as, you know, participant in this war, even if they're not participants in that war. So in the very, very long run, it's um, or in a short run, but in the long run, it's an incredible tragedy uh, for the Russians because it will take generations to get out of the shame that they are that they are in now. And I think what happened with this invasion, with this war, with this approaching occupation is very similar to what happened in 1917 with the Bolshevik revolution, that 10 days that shook the world. It was very similar to 1991 when the Soviet Union was no longer there when Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, the president then of the Russian Federation stood on the tank and said, we want freedom and it changed the world tremendously. Um, and I think now we're in that absolutely pivotal moment in, uh, in, uh, in world history and in Russian history. Unfortunately for Russia, there's not even a way forward. So I'll end there and, and we can get to questions and answers if there is something we can consider more later. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nina, uh, for sharing that with us, um, particularly sort of the, the view that we often don't get. Um, it must be very difficult to straddle two worlds between Russia and the West. And so we really appreciate you sharing those thoughts with us. Um, I'm gonna next uh, call on uh, Jessica Pisano. Um, in addition to reacting to what Nina has said, I'd like you also maybe to draw on some of your own work and tell us a little bit about maybe the political theater that you may think is on display. Jessica. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, Nina, for those comments. So um, I am going to, Peter, if you don't mind, I think I'm gonna focus on, um, on the real and let you read about the political theater uh, in my book when it comes out. Um, I'm gonna speak to everyone today, um, I think uh, sort of on a human, not analytical, but on a human level, um, having not prepared uh, formal comments, I'm going to speak contemporaneously, but I want to bring our focus, um, now that we've heard about a Russian perspective, I wanna bring our focus to the experience of Ukrainians um, now. Um, I'm gonna to try to navigate between the pathos and the triumphalism that we find in um, media coverage um, and between sort of dry social science analysis and, um, and then the emotionalism too that can accompany um, some of our responses to, to this. Um, I think unlike Nina, I am not at all surprised. Um, my perspective is of someone who has spent um, time over the last 30 years working on both sides of the Russia and Ukraine border in rural areas um, on the Ukraine side of the of its western border with um, European Union countries. Um, and although I feel shocked by the um, barbarity of the um, of the attacks, uh, I, I am not in the least surprised. I think Ukrainians have um, known that this was coming in some form. Um, the shock, however, I'd like to analyze. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end of my comments, because I think it's a question that we all need to ask ourselves, why we are shocked. Um, Russia has used um, thermobaric weapons, the weapons that Ukrainians um, encountered this past night, um, which are second only to nuclear weapons in their um, force. And so while Ukraine may stand at the end of this, um, Ukrainians will pass through um, something uh, that is um, not um, a common experience in contemporary warfare. However, and this gets to our question about why we are shocked, um, Russia has used these weapons in Syria, in Chechnya. Um, so I'll come back to that question in a minute. I wanna anchor my comments in um, the experiences as we understand them of what Ukrainians are experiencing as we are speaking right now. And I really wanna focus on the human here because um, this is happening in real time and we are analyzing in real time. And I think we owe it to um, the people that we're talking about to acknowledge the reality that they are experiencing while we're talking about them. Um, so uh, while we're having this conversation, um, Ukrainians across the country in cities are sitting in um, subways, as you know, sheltering from bombs because it is nighttime. Um, they are in other forms of bomb shelter. Um, in some cities, they do not have access to uh, drinking water. Um, it's Feb it's March now in Ukraine. Uh, it's colder than in New York. Um, some places do not have heat. There's concern about um, food supplies running out in a few weeks as Russian troops are encircling cities in a classic Soviet military formation. Um, in these subway stations where people are taking shelter, there are people of all ages. There are young children. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Crowded conditions, people very close to one another. Um, with uh, bombs overhead. So that's the context we're talking about. Um, what is it that these people want that they are forced into this situation um, to live where they live, <laughs> to um, have self-government, 
панувати у своїй сторонці, as the Ukrainian national anthem puts it, to be the ones in charge on their, on their land. Um, and it's for this that they're being punished. Yesterday, last night, um, in addition to the thermobaric weapon that was used um, in the city of Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, um, um, the city administration was hit with um, a, a ballistic missile. You may have seen the video footage. Um, I want to just rest with Kharkiv for a minute here. Um, just a little bit of history to enrich our discussion that you may not be reading in the newspapers or hearing in the television news. So this is not the first time that Kharkiv has felt Moscow's wrath. In the 1920s, the city was the capital of um, Soviet Ukraine. And it was like Paris at the time. It was a center of literary and theatrical and, and other artistic activity. Um, people like Khulovy and uh, Kurbas and others, um, the predecessors of contemporary poets like Serhiy Zhadon, um, were developing a revolutionary Ukrainian literature. Um, many of these people were um, shot in the basement of the building of the NKVD, which is just um, in front of one of the buildings, the the um, the opera theater that was uh, that was bombed yesterday. Um, so at that time, Stalin targeted uh, the people of Kharkiv, and and now we have Putin targeting the people of Kharkiv, not because they are bearers of um, a Ukrainian language revolutionary literature but because they are like New Yorkers. They are part of a multicultural, multi-confessional, messy, international, interesting, vibrant, democratic society. So one of the things that I wanna highlight for us is that while this war is unfolding in Ukraine, its target is not Ukraine only. Um, the target here is, is the West, right? Broadly speaking, it's everything we associate with um, democratic societies, with urbanism, with um, many of the things that people in this Zoom room today uh, share with people in Kharkiv who yesterday received ballistic missiles over their heads and who a few hours prior to that received cluster bombs, both of which are not um, either um, accepted under the Geneva Convention or widely used by other countries. I think we need to take from this that um, we can expect more of the same and that the limits to which we have become accustomed in um, many conflicts do not apply here. Now here's why I'd, where I'd like to ask us a question and ask us a question of our own consciences. And this has to do with why we're shocked by this. Again, I'm not surprised, but I do feel shocked. So the question is this, why do we care about Ukraine? I would argue that there's a good reason to care about Ukraine and there's a reason we should be asking questions about as the world responds to Ukraine and to Russia's attack upon it. The thing that gives me pause and the thing I, I worry about and the thing I wonder about as we feel shock as these weapons um, that have been used before are unleashed on a European population. As we see um, video footage of fair-haired, fair-skinned women and children crossing European borders by the hundreds of thousands and we're paying attention. A few years ago, when refugees from other places where recipients of ballistic missiles and similar weapons um, were also, also had hellfire raining down over their heads. And I'd like us to ask ourselves about our reactions then. So that's, a concern I have. 
On the other hand, the reason why I believe that we all need to be paying attention to this, notwithstanding what I just said, is that the war on Ukraine is a war on democracy. It is a war on a set of values. Ukrainian people are standing up um, by themselves right now to protect those things. But I guess I'd like to wonder if they do not prevail, if their airspace is not protected, what does democracy look like for us afterwards? What is its future? What does it mean morally for um, places that see themselves as embodying certain values to stand by and watch this? And what does that mean about um, our responsibilities to care for one another? So I'll stop there and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, uh, for very um, moving unpacking, giving us some historical context, but really uh, challenging us to think about um, how we are all involved in this. So thank you. Um, I'm going to next uh, ask uh, Everita Selena for her thoughts on uh, the previous comments, but also speak to regional reactions and responses, including the that of the European Union. Everita? Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you for invitation. Um, I wanted to open my observations uh, with a tweet that somebody tweeted this weekend as a kind of summation, I guess, of where Europe uh, stands at the moment. And the tweet went something like that, that Putin ended Swedish neutrality and German pacifism in one weekend. Um, many uh, commentators see uh, Europe, this being a major moment for Europe, Europe in, in wider sense, uh, that it is a challenge to post-World War II uh, security architecture or post-1997 security architecture, um, but it's also kind of um, wake-up call for Europe to get its act together vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its uh, neighboring regions, uh, as well as its own sense of identity. And so uh, many interpret the, the decision to allocate 450 billion that the European Union has now put in a common fund to assist Ukraine with military means as a major uh, statement as to where Europe is going to go in the future and uh, how it will see its relationship uh, both to its own internal members as well as to its external neighborhood. Um, it, you know, it is, Perhaps we can see in those kind of historical terms, as Nina said, this is also his, we need to see this as an epoch changing moment uh, for Russia. Uh, perhaps it is an also epoch changing moment for Europe and maybe as Jessica's question suggests for entire world in terms of uh, where, where our values stand and what we feel we are defending. Um, as I was reading through various changes that have taken place uh, both at European level and uh, within different EU member states, I did get a kind of nagging feeling as to why we are celebrating uh, the rearmament of Europe, because that was one of the comments persistently being made that finally Europe is being uh, clear eyed about its need to increase its defense spending. It can no longer sort of ride on the coattails of uh, America, of the United States and its uh, military presence in Europe. Um, Germany has broken its uh, long standing um, kind of pacifism, if you want to call it that, and has agreed to, to send weapons directly to Ukraine, but also allow other uh, actors who have purchased its weapons to send those weapons to Ukraine. It has decided to bolster its defense spending. Um, and all of these are taunted as good signs of European unity, which of course, you know, in a current moment, that's uh, what we want and what we need, presumably. Um, the unity in uh, the sanctions, once German, Germany changed this approach, uh, sanctions were also um, able to proceed along the way, and there were no major obstacles. Uh, countries who have uh, generally been neutral, Ireland, Austria, um, and Malta have abstained, but have not objected to, to this contribution by European Union. But at the same time, we're obviously celebrating the rearmament, right? We're celebrating Germany's willing to 
uh, let go of its post-World War II attitude towards uh, war and peace and towards its own self-identity and rethink it uh, towards a first, perhaps more, uh, if necessary, aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis whoever the future threat is, right? And so that left me feeling uh, very uncomfortable with this new uh, Europe is together moment, right? Um, there are also um, suggestions that, uh, of course, um, Europe is willing to um, support all its member states, and NATO is uh, is boosting its eastern flank in Baltics and uh, and in Poland. Um, but again, we are essentially ceding to the kind of uh, militaristic desires of the moment, right? I mean, are we really envisioning? Um, NATO battle with with Russia over the Baltics as anything more anything other than a, a global battle at that point, right? And that is certainly a very very um, horrifying and sobering thought. In this hurry to to send weapons and to send troops and to announce this kind of military posturing, also on NATO and European side, uh, I don't have an answer. I'm just raising some uh, thoughts and kind of disquiet I feel when I read these news. Uh, on one hand, we want a concerted action. On the other hand, uh, that action is uh, very aggressive in its own way, right? And, and certainly entails for Europe an identity that is much more militaristic than it has been up to this point. Um, I also wanted to kind of perhaps bring into this conversation um, a broader kind of regional and global view. Um, you know, if you take, for example, view from Turkey, right? Uh, Turkey uh, imports 80% of its grain uh, from Ukraine and Russia together. It has already been in major economic crisis uh, for years and uh, is about to hit an even bigger crisis, right? People already are having very hard time affording basic staples. And the fact that it, it is one of the main trading partners with Russia and also with Ukraine is going only further to increase that pain. Uh, the bread subsidies are gonna have to be increased. Uh, oil subsidies will have to be increased. And whether Turkish state is in position to do so is not at all clear. Uh, Erdogan has gone ahead and closed the straits um, to Russian ships. So in one way, he has made his statement, I guess, on that relationship. Uh, but uh, expectations, of course, were that tourists would be back. Russian tourists account for number one tourists in, in Turkey, five million last year. Uh, same with Ukrainian tourists. Uh, it's a uh, you know, typical tourist uh, place to go for Ukrainians. All of that now seems to be in jeopardy, not least because the travel is going to be difficult and uh, and restrictions and sanctions, but also because uh, with the re revocation of SWIFT exchange, it's not clear how any people would pay for these uh, holidays, right? Uh, so we already see the reverberations very quickly uh, impacting the near kind of uh, European area, but even further afield, if you think of uh, countries in Africa and, Latin and, and South America who also purchase wheat from Russia and Ukraine, uh, they're going to be, they're even less well positioned to uh, deal with rising prices that are inevitable in the situation, right? Are we going to have the same kind of unified solidarity approach towards these issues as we are having with a kind of military uh, speed, which we are willing to give to kind of military issues, right? So that's, again, a, a question uh, when we think about what is both a European response, what is a regional response, and what is a global response. And what we feel we are responding to, right? If we are just responding to kind of military aggression, we our viewpoint is very limited, uh, and we see this, you know, very immediately um, as uh, Jessica pointed out, you know, kind of bifurcated and uh, response to Syrian crisis. You can look again right now on a border um, with Poland and Ukraine, and uh, that that is the one that I, I saw the latest report. Students from Ukraine. Um, who are Turkish, who are Kenyan, who are uh, not Ukrainian, uh, are not being processed, in fact, are being uh, potentially abused, quite severely beaten, uh, and not allowed uh, that immediate access to EU territory, right? Um, so the solidarity, you know, quote unquote, is, is there with a very particular understanding of what it can be directed towards, right? Um, there is a call among the European members to, of course, extend all uh, humanitarian assistance to fleeing Ukrainians, uh, but only to fleeing Ukrainians. You know, we have always this uh, knack for really uh, identifying very narrow band of humanitarian assistance that we are willing to give. Um, and amongst all these kind of 
um, you know, high expectations for European unity and humanitarianism. Uh, the question already starts popping up on uh, Deutsche Welle today. I heard someone raising that. Well, how long will Europeans be able to uh, sort of stomach refugee influx, uh, given how uh, sort of tired they are already of refugees? Something to that effect, right? That was not Deutsche Welle wasn't saying this. They were uh, sort of speaking to officials. Um, and so, you know, already we see potentially that, again, um, there is uh, impetus and there is push towards one particular kind of solution. And that solution, sadly, only leads towards much more aggression, right? And much more uh, sort of physical violence as opposed to uh, other ways of perhaps addressing it. Um, in terms of Baltics, um, uh, Baltics are amongst, uh, I thought I'd say something on it. I think there may be an expectation I would say something on it. Uh, Baltics have... Um, Agit, you know, kind of argued for years together with Poland uh, and some other countries that, uh, you know, Europe needs to be much more sort of uh, clear eyed, as they would have said, about uh, Putin's intentions. Uh, they probably feel vindicated in their warnings. Um, at the same time, I think populations on the ground uh, have a trepidation as to where this is heading. Um, I know some of my family members think that, uh, you know, we're not going to. Uh, escape this this uh, this war, and um, and so th there is a great deal of anxiety and worry about uh, what will come. Um, even with the NATO NATO presence, I don't know how much uh, people rely on that to uh, to really protect them. Um, but in kind of you, you will symbolic move, uh, the Baltic states together with um, Czech Republic, Poland, Slovenia, Slovakia uh, issued a statement over the weekend. Um, urging your, or actually it was on Monday, they issued a statement urging um, European Union to kind of accelerate the Ukraine's candidacy uh, to European Union. And you see today that uh, President Zelensky made the kind of impassioned uh, uh, plea to uh, to European Parliament in an extraordinary session that they were holding to accept Ukraine into EU membership uh, immediately as a way of showing that they are serious about their commitment to Ukraine, but also uh, they are serious about common values um, that Ukraine and, and EU uh, share. Um, and, uh, you know, this, you know, however symbolic these moves are, this is, a, as everyone immediately rushed to point out, this is a very technical and long process. So uh, there is no chance of EU accepting Ukraine uh, immediately into the fold, um, but they might be able to expedite the um, kind of the first stages of bringing it on as a candidate country. And so again, there's a lot of kind of uh, grandstanding, a lot of symbolic gestures, uh, whether those are important to people in Ukraine, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't dare to speak for it. Uh, they might be important to politicians and to others. Um, and Europe certainly feels that it needs to step into the moment and do do what it's supposed to be doing. Right? Um, but again, uh, as a kind of to end this, I would just say uh, there are no local wars, obviously, in this day and age. Uh, everyone is impacted and the reverberations we are already seeing. Uh, but not only that everyone is impacted, uh, that where the impacts are going to be focused in what kind of areas, uh, food, air travel, prices uh, for all kinds of items, impact on supply chains. Somebody know that the United States was having to start increasing its fracking in the Western states in order to you know, offset the loss in supplies. I just wonder if we are ready for that as well, right? In terms of domestic kind of politics, in terms of uh, relationships, in terms of the solidarity that supposedly we are willing to offer. Thank you, Everita. Um, the questions about European identity, I think are particularly salient and useful uh, and they touch, uh, they connect very well to Jessica's observations as well. So thank you. Um, I just wanna put a few more things on the table and then we can uh, get another round of comments uh, from our panel. And then uh, I invite you to put things in the chat as well, questions we can ask. Um, the comments I wanted to make um, first are really regarding some of the politics associated with the strategies being deployed that we see from uh, Russia. And, um, you know, in uh, Clausewitz, there's the classic aphorism that war is the continuation of politics. But what we're really 
perhaps on the cusp of is uh, politics as the continuation of war here, because a number of the tactics displayed are extremely troubling in this respect. Um, among the vanguard of forces, uh, I understand, was the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group is a Russian private military company. Uh, this is a mimic of, in fact, much of what uh, the West has done in some of its interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, using uh, private soldiers so that um, the body bags that return uh, aren't used as a political liability um, in domestic politics. And uh, an autocrat regime like uh, Putin may feel insulated, but um, relying on contractors is a way to continue to buff, uh, you know, protect yourself politically. The other aspect of the strategic situation that I find extremely troubling is the size of the military force that's been deployed. Um, there has been a lot of talk about whether or not uh, Russia aims to occupy and uh, Ukraine. Well, the size of the military footprint is strangely small and much more reminiscent of what a military would want to do that would conduct uh, mass atrocities or ethnic cleansing campaigns. Uh, if it has about two th uh, 200,000 troops, there's a population of 44 million in Ukraine. That is a force ratio of less than four soldiers per 1,000 civilians. Now, in other comparable conflicts, um, we've never ever seen a successful um, occupation force that small. What we see is um, a resort to uh, atrocities, sad to say. If you even compare it with what the Allies did in post-World War II Germany, uh, the force footprint was a ratio of 100 to 1,000, much more able to build some sort of stability and engage in pacification or a hearts and minds campaign. That's not what we're seeing out of uh, the Russian forces. The second area of comments that I wanted to mention is about the also broader international politics. Um, I think um, there are two other aspects here I find uh, troubling as well. Uh, among them is that, uh, you know, when people talk about wars, sometimes they talk about winners and losers. There are no winners ever, um, but if there was to be one, uh, it seems to be it, it, it's China in the sense that uh, Russia will be in a debilitated state regardless of uh, the outcome of the military struggle such that uh, it seems that uh, Russia would be a vassal state to China in the future in the sense that a lot of people draw parallels with what Russia is doing and Nazi Germany. Uh, the parallel I would say that is much more relevant here is Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. Um, in that conflict, uh, Italy did not have great success initially in fighting Ethiopia. It wasn't until they aligned themselves with Germany, a bigger power, that uh, they were they were able to defeat Ethiopia. And I'm I see that sort of uh, the politics of how China has been playing this as reminiscent of uh, Germany's strategy at that time. I think related to this, and the final point I'll make is about the crisis this poses for the United Nations system. Uh, the Security Council has clearly been paralyzed with Russia possessing a veto. Uh, the UN General Assembly has attempted to have some uh, discussions about this under the so-called Uniting for Peace uh, system. But all of this raises uh, the issue about the relevance of uh, the UN. Uh, the UN's great value has always been that it averted uh, a so-called World War III, prevented great power uh, conflict. If this is what is at hand, um, this will undercut the um, legitimacy and the authority of the UN, which is needed on a host of other problems beyond peace and security, but development, environment, et cetera. So um, it bodes ill for that as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, now ask um, the panelists to make any other remarks they would like to make before we open up for question and answer. And I'll go back in the same order. So let me turn back to uh, Nina. Nina, please. Well, I mean, it's, there's so many things that we can discuss. Um, I want to, go back to what uh, Jessica said and Iverita said that that the um, and you did Peter too uh, that the implications of it 
even if the war somehow subsides, is going to be tremendous. And what I continue to to struggle with is how to is how Putin plans to play it out. What's the because that doesn't seem to be comprehension at all, even in the military. When you read the military reports, it's very unclear what it is exactly they're trying to do. Do they try to unseat President Zelensky and arguing that it's denazification, which is the most bizarre word you can uh, you can possibly imagine? What is their street to street battle? What are their um, uh, blocking or blockades of all the cities? Which purpose is that? I mean, what it is if it is an occupational force, and you say it's too small of an occupational force, and Russia says it doesn't want to occupy all the Russia says a lot of things, so who knows? What is the final outcome of this? What what are they planning to do? What are, Who are they actually pursuing there as an enemy? I mean, they say it's all the Nazi forces that are puppeteering government of, of the West. Uh, so Ukraine does seem and kind of uh, to the point that Jessica, I think, was making as well, is that Ukraine, in a weird, very weird way, because of course Ukraine has been a um, kind of an appendage to uh, the Russian Empire for all its existence, and certainly since 1600s. As you know, in the beginning, it was one Kiev and Rus, and then in 1600s, the um, U- Ukrainian military polity, I mean, it's too, basically very much of a shorthand. Uh, became associated with Russia and then later was sort of absorbed completely into, into an empire. It's just not entirely clear. And But so in, in this particular case, it seems that even if Ukraine, as Putin says, won with Russia, it is also being fought as a proxy war, which is, you know, the reason I struggle even to find words to describe all this, because it seems to be kind of bad collection of, different political treatises, different political literature forms, or different literature forms, different fictional uh, fictional works, because it's, it's almost none of them are gelling together and yet they are happening in real life. So it is a proxy war because one of the things that clearly is happening is that Putin is looking into Biden's eyes or Biden is looking into Putin's eyes. It's not, they're not seeing souls of each other clearly as as, uh, George W. Bush once said about Putin, you remember. But what they're really seeing is that there's the battle of the wills happening is that you, you know, Joe Biden wanted uh, a a predictable relationship and so wanted to meet, met with Putin in in June uh, last year and wanted to keep Putin in his box. But Putin understood it in entirely different ways that he wanted to be expanding the box that Russia was kept in or so Putin Putin thought. And what's remarkable is that, um, you know, Ukraine now in some way, a ridiculous way, plays the role of Afghanistan in the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union expanded the empire, thinking that it's protecting its borders from uh, from Western influences in 79. And of course, in 89, they had to withdraw up to 10 years of horror and impossible uh, impossible situation. And then just a few years later, the Soviet Union stopped to exist. And so my point is that I think, you know, whatever Putin wants is a staring Biden in the face uh, and saying, uh, this is my region, get out of my region, uh, ultimately is going to end badly, certainly for Russia, but also going to end badly, uh, or as Verita kind of outlined, end badly for the rest of the world while uh, all this battle of the wills between the United States and Russia being played out because um, Putin in his, I think now deeply delusional mind because what he has done, Jessica may have not been surprised, but it was certainly an absolute shock because it's in no calculation that can that can end well, uh, that can end well at all. And uh, uh, so in that Putin's delusional mind, he's fighting for the great power status that he feels the United States was denying him was denying him for so long. And when that happens, and it happened in the 20th century, although unfortunately the leaders at that time were slightly more, uh, at least leaders on both sides, and certainly much more humane than Putin, uh, and human than Putin 
Putin is now, they were able, and I speak about the Cuban Missile Crisis, they were able, when the threat was such, they were able to end it in 13 days, understanding what a disaster it is for the world. And I just don't see it's happening right now. I don't have an answer of how it's going to end, but uh, I am, um, you know, basically now kind of agreeing with Jessica's wisdom is that we shouldn't be surprised and we should be expecting the worst. Jessica? Thanks. Um, so there's a lot to say here. Um, I uh, very, okay. So I think um, with respect to Putin, I, I wanna say a little bit about strategic objectives, um, acknowledging that I do not know what he thinks. And frankly, anyone who tells you that they know what he thinks has a bridge to sell you in, in my opinion. Um, but there are things about the situation that are consistent with the way in which he um, has framed things over time. Um, I noticed just now in the chat, there's a bit of a discussion about the helpfulness of West, the West and Western values as, as conceptual categories. I do want to note that that is precisely the con conceptual language that the Putin regime uses to talk about their objectives. And I think it, you know, whether if we even if we don't accept that. Um, framing conceptually, I think we do need to understand that if we want to figure out what's going on here, um, we have to acknowledge that 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 is the that is the way in which um, Russian political elites describe what it is they are thinking about, um, and then we can do with that uh, what we wish. Um, I, I'd like to um, come back to something that Arita said um, about prices um, and inflation. Um, the, um, you know, I, I think we want to be careful about assuming that imperialism is the right frame here and that what Putin wants is, um, to acquire something as to, as opposed to, to do harm to something, um, as opposed to a revanchist kind of, um, approach, um, for a number of years, um, a great deal of Russian, uh, foreign policy has been oriented toward provoking crisis in uh, in the so-called West. And um, the economic costs of this, um, first of all, through refugee flows, and second of all, through inflation, um, are going to have an effect on both European and transatlantic unity, um, even if it seems strong right now, and also on, um, on democratic processes, right? I mean, who imagines that an incumbent American president might be elected if gas costs $5 at the pump for any period of time. Um, and this is why this is extremely dangerous for um, democracy, given what the current alternatives are in the American political system. Um, so, so I think it is worth attending to that. Um, a couple of words about denazification and the language of denazification, again, separating our um, categories of analysis from categories of practice, right? The concepts that Putin is using to do politics and the concepts that we use to analyze it. Denazification makes no sense, right, to our ears as a concept used to analyze what is going on here. However, in Russia, denazification is an extremely resonant um, political concept as a category of practice, right? As, um, as something that politicians use to do politics. And this has to do with the um, politics of memory around the Second World War and how uh, a certain generation of Russians has come to see and understand what Ukraine represents to them seen through memorializations, um, official memorializations as promulgated by uh, the Putin government over the last number of years. So, um, you know, although we may read that as a projection, denazification, right, and the possibility, as um, Peter suggested, that that may be a harbinger or a suggestion that there is genocide to come, um, it also is a um, signal to a domestic constituency, which, you know, genuinely believes that there are Nazis in Ukraine. Now, it is important to note that um, there are far right parties in Ukraine who have been doing the work of the state and providing social services, but they're not Zelensky's party. So in some ways there is something that's counterintuitive about this entire um, enterprise. Um, however, and this is the last point. Pying force, right? What, what exactly does Putin intend to do after having 
um, you know, committed vast violence against a civilian population? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. If he were to want to um, try to govern the way that Russia has um, governed by proxy in Lugansk and Donetsk, um, in the Donbass, um, that method of governance has, um, by, by referendum, right, um, by plebiscite, uh, has uh, has mimicked in many ways the way, and this is the political theory part, the way that um, Putin's regime is supported in Russia, right? I mean, Putin is not widely personally liked, right, in the Russian Federation, but people vote for him um, because his rule rests on um, complex clientelistic relationships that are implemented at a local level. Um, so if we think about this as theater, you know, Putin is the dramaturge sitting in the audience, and then the people... Um, back, backstage are making sure that the players are know, know their part, right? But Putin doesn't necessarily know what's going on back there. And so, you know, if he thinks that this approach is going to work in Ukraine, um, that would seem like a mistake, right? Because it depends on the local knowledge of local actors who are willing to cooperate um, in an occupation. And, and that does not look likely at the present moment. So, um, you know, we have these two hypotheses about what might happen next. And I, I don't want to encourage speculation about this, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, we need to watch closely um, what is happening and also finally not dismiss monstrous acts as simply the behavior of a monster. We need to be thinking about strategic objectives and the destruction of the European Union and the destruction of Western democratic processes by Western, I mean that in the traditional sense, even though I don't like the term myself, um, have been long-term uh, and repeated uh, policy objectives of the, of the Putin government. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Everita, do you wanna chime in on these? Um, yeah, I've been looking at some of the chat comments too. And so I think I wanna make kind of two points. Um, one um, has to do with the kind of, I guess, violence breeds violence idea or sense that, uh, you know, there is what is meant by this kind of post-World War II security order is also kind of thin, I guess, feeling that certain things can't be done, even though, of course, uh, they have been done in other places outside Europe to other people, right? Uh, but there still is this presumed idea that certain things are not acceptable. Uh, and what this uh, uh, war in Ukraine is making many fear is that certain things now will be seen as acceptable behavior by other states. Uh, most uh, in immediately to mind comes Serbia and its relationship to Kosovo and its relationship visa Republika Srpska to Bosnia. Um, our uh, alumni on the ground in Sarajevo tells me today that people in Bosnia are very worried. The government there is calling for NATO to add troops because they're worried about that this might be a good moment for Republika Srpska to uh, to initiate its own campaign of either secession or perhaps um, military action. Um, people in Kosovo are worried that Serbia will use this as perhaps opportunity to uh, go into Mitrovica and you know settle quote unquote uh, that ongoing uh, dispute. And uh, there was a question in the chat from somebody about China, what China might do with regard to Taiwan. So that's what I mean by this kind of thin, uh, you know, layer of feeling of what is permissible, what isn't on a more global scale, right? That violence kind of generates, as we saw also during pandemic, right? When there was a sense that somehow now, you know, random acts of violence are, you know, taking place because there's a sense of breakdown and uh, an order, uh, societal order, uh, you know, on the international level, we can think of this moment perhaps as, uh, inaugurating that kind of breakdown as well. So that was one comment I wanted to make that, you know, in kind of more geo, kind of immediate uh, concerns about other um, conflicts or other spaces where um, certain kind of lessons are being taken away that we don't uh, expect. The other comment um, that I wanted to make is about a point that obviously many critics have raised uh, throughout, um, you know, throughout years, but also in last uh, week about uh, the West's role in all of this, right? Um, the, especially the West's role in uh, um, weakening and disparaging Russia at the end of uh, Cold War and in, in uh, you know uh, the shock therapy that was um, hoisted upon it, right? With great fanfare, 
Um, and so these are uh, points that also are in our chat about how we should evaluate the United States as well as Western complicity in this. And uh, obviously, I've been part of these kind of critiques myself uh, from kind of political economy perspective, right? What what happened in many uh, former Soviet republics, obviously including in Russia, uh, you know, was uh, was a tragedy. Let's put it that way. There is no other way to put it, right? After uh, Cold War ended. It was a Western triumphalism, right? The the, the, the talk of uh, that the West had won the Cold War, uh, Russia was beaten, Soviet Union was no more, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And the economic policies that followed had the same kind of approach. But I'm having a hard time seeing how that critique aids in knowing what to how to respond to current situation or what to talk how to talk about, uh, you know, what to do next or what responses should be taken. So while I think the critique is uh, important and we need to perhaps go through it and and, and discuss uh, how we feel about these uh, kind of relationships and complicities of different actors um, in terms of immediate or even a kind of long-term view towards future, I'm not sure uh, how that um, aids us. Um, other than saying, let's not repeat a mistake, but I don't think we are going to face and are not facing right now a similar set of uh, challenges as as perhaps the world did uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart. So those are just two small comments I wanted to make and, and leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Everita. Uh, you know, picking up on, the, on that observation about sort of this moment and what it could hold, you know, it, I think this issue about Russia as a imperial power or, you know, this new occupation this isn't the first time this comes up in world order, sad to say, right? I mean, uh, these, we didn't see these types of reactions with China and Tibet, uh, China, India and Pakistan and Kashmir, Morocco and Western Sahara, Israel and Palestine. These are other occupations that um, world order has not really come to terms with. And, you know, why is this uh, such the monumental crisis? Clearly it's in Europe, maybe there is a cultural and racial component to it seeing, uh, you know, the white fair skinned people fleeing. Um, those are certainly aspects uh, to consider. Um, I've been look following the chat and I've tried to group together some questions because we only have about 20 minutes remaining. And I think uh, to follow up on uh, something that Everita mentioned, but I'd like to get everybody's comments here on the panel is about, you know, there's been some people who talk about, well, it's Putin's domestic support and cronies. Is it the West? Is it the role of NATO acting provocatively? Even within the United States, there are far right parties and far right actors who are branding Putin a genius, et cetera, and so forth. So what I guess I wanted to say is uh, ask the panelists is to also reflect upon how this, how this is diffused down into these domestic uh, political contexts beyond those larger international aspects. We've already started to speak to it some, but since a number of people have asked about it, uh, let me go back to the panel one more time and ask them about uh, Putin's domestic support or how um, the role of NATO and within the West, uh, this is being portrayed. So I'll start again with Nina, Jessica and Everita in that order. Oh, Nina, you're muted still. Thank so you. sorry, so sorry. Uh, there is certainly Putin's domestic support uh, but the, the support has been waning for quite some time. As I said, I mean, it has been a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, it just, and as always happens when dictatorships fall hard on you, it's, I mean, rarely probably it happens in just one weekend, but but that, that can happen too. Uh, and uh, uh, so the waning of support has been has been around, that's no question. But there is also those hardliners uh, who um, pick up on the propaganda that is being pushed forward. That kind of the Nazi, um, uh, the Nazi forces that that are being celebrated in in Ukraine, and they are being celebrated in Ukraine. I mean, their days, uh, their days that you know, there's a uh, monument to Bandera. Their days when those marches take take place, they are not part of. Uh, in any way of the Zelensky party, <clears throat> but they're also not being, uh, but Zelensky also, uh, Zelensky also relies on the, uh, uh, on the nationalists in his support. 
Because as you remember, when he came in as president, his whole idea was to be unifying and you know trying to uh, solve the solve the crisis, solve the problem. And then it turned out that it's not possible because even if I mean I'm not going to go through what the Minsk agreements are because we've been hearing a lot about them. But even the idea that he can uh, he can implement them would be really tre- treason to a country of uh, uh, of an independent country. So of course they were not being. Uh, they're not being met. And uh, somehow he needed to deal with those nationalists. And so some of them are, uh, some of them are far right. But of course, uh, I think Jessica pointed out, so Russians picked up on that particular moment and turned into in a giant propaganda campaign of how those Nazis are coming in and we are both going to face the, um, uh, the problem of, um, uh, the problem of the new Hitlerism and, and, and whatnot. So that is being thoroughly exploited. A lot of people absolutely see through this and not buying this, even if they think that, you know, the West is very nasty to, to the Russians and being in, insulting and whatnot. But a lot of people actually kind of also want, because, and I think that's a tension uh, that we rarely discuss even in, in the American kind of public space that the quite the tensions between Ukraine and Russia, they didn't, they weren't created in 2014. I mean, they've really existed throughout history. They existed when uh, in 16, I forgot, Jessica probably knows better, in 16, 54, 35, whatever, when uh, uh, when this military polity became part of Russia. And then they've been all these tensions that finally came to the blow on both sides. So both sides react violently to um, to the potential resolution of, of uh, potential resolution of, of the problem. But I think what goes against Putin right now, not that he's not going to make it go for him because now even people with a lapel pin that has a Ukrainian flag are being arrested just for that. You don't, you don't even need to say anything. You're just basically a traitor because you mention, you mention Ukraine. So what is going, against Putin in a sense is that idea, and it's not even just the sanctions, is that the idea that, uh, you know, the brouhaha of the Russians, well, they hate us, but look at us and we are here and we are going to show them, those of you who know Russian, move on Pakajem, so we'll just show them how we can do it. It's dying down even in the supporters because ultimately when you are going against the world, No country has done it. I mean, you know, maybe Iran did a little bit. But as I said, this is one more, and you actually mentioned those occupations that are local occupations. This has become a global one because everybody withdrawing their support. And so that something, so something that Putin claims he has brought to Russia, that is respect and recognition, now is backfiring. And so we'll see how that is going to play in in domestic politics. Yes, it does. Thanks. So I'll I'll come back to something that is is related to this question that was um, mentioned by a number of people asking about 2014 and about separatism and sort of um, how we might think about that in relation to the claims that are made by the Russian government right now with respect to NATO and the suffering supposed of um, people in uh, in the Donbas uh, supposedly caused by um, Ukrainian response. Um, I want to note that in 2014, there was a brief moment between the departure of uh, Viktor Yanukovych and the presidential elections in Ukraine that spring that um, in which there was a genuine constitutional crisis, right, in which there were people in Ukraine who were concerned about uh, revolutionary means of changing the government um, and who, you know, responded um, to uh, the proxies that Russia supplied uh, to the Donbass, um, resulting ultimately in the uh, Russian-guided referenda that were conducted there. Um, However, in 2022, the claim that Russia somehow is justified in invading um, the the rest of Ukraine in order to protect Russian speakers in the Donbass is is simply... um, nonsense, right? I mean, the sort of the the, the saying about this uh, among Ukrainians is that R- Russians, uh, Russian speakers in Ukraine are freer than Russian speakers in Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, the attack on the city of Kharkiv, um, uh, I think, is an illustration of this, right? That the, the city of Kharkiv is pro-Ukrainian, um, but almost entirely Russian speaking at the moment. Um, and that there's, we should not be fooled by claims about that. Um, Likewise, with respect to NATO, although we do need to 
analyze this um, because it is um, considered important by the Kremlin. You know, it bears repeating as many times as, po as possible that NATO is a defensive alliance. Um, and uh, I, I don't think there's any serious argument that NATO, um, although Russia felt left out of um, NATO, um, decisions that were made a long time ago, uh, there's no serious argument uh, to be made about the threat of a, of a, a NATO attack on Russia, um, at least prior to all of this. Um, so I, I think that we need to keep those points in mind. And then very, lastly, um, someone had asked about uh, the US State Department and Ukraine and US intervention in Ukraine. I mean, there is no doubt that, um, you know, the United States engages in democracy promotion activities. And, uh, and that is part of what the United States does. Um, however, um, the argument about Ukraine being a client state of the United States, which is the Kremlin position, um, really reflects the Kremlin's ideas about how it deals with other states. Right. It's 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 a it's a it's one more projection, I would say, um, by Russian political elites onto American politics, assuming that the way Rush, the Russian state deals with others is the way that the United States deals with others. So I would be careful about um, about those equivalency arguments as well. Thanks. Um, since I opened my remark by kind of talking about internal politics of, of EU a little bit, uh, I'll just mention, you know, some of the uh, immediate impacts on internal politics in some member states. Um, I just read that Macron has gone up in, uh, in polls for, uh, you know, for his uh, not yet, in, you know, candidacy for president uh, based on his seemingly kind of, a you know, a strong stance towards Russia. So there is, you know, a little pivot already taking place. Uh, there was, of course, a uh, great deal of support by Le Pen um, uh, to Putin, you know, verbally. Uh, and so the, the far right has sort of taken a little bit of a, of a uh, hit from what's going on. How long this is going to be sustained, I, I don't know. Um, somebody uh, conjectured that the choice of timing uh, for uh, invasion of Ukraine was based on kind of, you know, change in German leadership and uh, Macron's concerns with domestic politics, hence now. Um, again, I, you know, uh, who, who knows uh, anyone's mind. Um, with regard to, you know, there are quite a lot of comments, uh, comments in our comments section about NATO um, and its role. I have to say as a, um, as a Latvian who lived through uh, parts of, you know, Cold War and the dissolution of Soviet Union, I was surprised when Latvia joined NATO that fast. And I thought it could not have been inter interpreted any other way by Russia as a certain kind of statement, right? Um, because it was, you know, um, obviously um, a sensitive issue already at that time. And of course, as uh, Putin has done, but also you don't really have to go to him, as many others have asked, uh, what was the point of NATO once the uh, Cold War ended, right? Given its particular uh, kind of meaning in the, the and its uh, formation in, in, in Cold War context. Um, so I think it, it has a meaning beyond just, uh, you know, kind of uh, defensive alliance. Um, as some commentators have pointed out its role in Kosovo and in, 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 in wars, Yugoslav wars, uh, but also clearly the way that uh, Baltic states and Poland and others who joined later see it, right, as a bulwark against threat. So yes, defensive, but not really. Also kind of at least symbolically offensive as a statement. Uh, as a statement where the East-West is located, right? The line sort of stops with NATO. Um, that being said, as I mentioned before, I'm not sure that in this moment that assessment helps as much, right? Those are conversations we've had um, prior to this. Uh, you know, we've critically examined NATO. We, we can continue to do so. But in this moment, when thinking about responses, when thinking about um, solidarity or thinking about options that might be open for diplomacy and other channels. I'm not sure that that is actually going to help us with, with these answers. And it's not going to help us with whatever we imagine the future uh, might look like. Um, so that's, I guess that's what I'm going to say. Okay, great. Um, we have, uh, I think, probably time for one last round of comments from our commentators. 
Um, we haven't had a chance perhaps to cover everything that's been raised in the chat. Let me just say that um, I know that several people seem to be asking about what's next or what can be done. What should the future of uh, Ukraine or Europe look like? How could we address this problem? But let me just also add the other sort of the big uh, unknown question, right, about what are we not asking about this crisis that we should be asking? What is not being said here that we should be talking about uh, besides, you know, great power politics, NATO, Europe, Europe. for some people it's, um, you know, we haven't really much talked about the global south. Uh, perhaps we haven't talked enough about um, energy and environment, et cetera. So just some fun, let me uh, ask the panelists for their final thoughts and to respond to any of this. Um, I'll start again with Nina and we'll go th back through to the finals. Please, Nina. I actually want to go to Jessica because she wanted to say something in response okay. to Everita. So maybe she can go now and, and, and do this together. Well, we'll, we'll go Jessica, Everita, and then back to you. How about that? Okay. Okay. Nice. Good. You're right. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Nina. Um, I just wanted to sort of circle back um, for a moment about NATO. Um, I think that criticism of NATO uh, with respect to Kosovo and other um, and other contexts is not incompatible with um, the idea that NATO does not pose a threat to the Russian Federation directly, right? That that um, that we need to sort of be careful about parsing um, the ways in which uh, Putin and, and Lavrov and other Russian political elites have have talked about NATO, and that um, and that those two ideas, I think we can at the um, time. Um, so, so that's that's number one. And then I really want to bring us back to to finish up um, to the question of democracy, um, whether or not we like uh, nomenclature used by Russian elites about Western values and so forth, and their idea of um, presenting themselves as an antipode to democracy. Um, I think we need to think very carefully about the consequences of um, the events that are now unfolding for the possibility that. Um, populations globally are going to have the opportunity to make decisions about choosing their leaders. Um, I, I, I repeat that I think that that is really what is at stake here. And then finally, what is also at stake are the people who live in Ukraine right now, their lives. Um, Ukraine may go through this, but um, there is an expectation uh, by military experts that we are going to see great, great civilian loss of life. Um, and I don't want to lose sight of that um, as we discuss the broader theoretical issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Everita, you want to come back in on this? Um, sorry, I got distracted by all the comments uh, that are going on and I feel we should be engaging with more directly. Um, Yeah, I think in this moment, you know, one kind of oscillates between sort of two poles that seem to be in completely different universes of or different realities, right? One is when you hear nuclear weapons invoked even indirectly, you know, the thought, the, the thought process sort of hits the wall. What can you say? What can you think? Right? Somebody asked in a comment, will this now teach uh, other countries that the only way to protect yourself is nuclear weapons? I think it teaches opposite. It teaches that the nuclear weapon isn't a weapon that can be used other than to essentially, you know, have a global melt argument, um, Armageddon. Right? I don't see, given the conflict that we are discussing, how anyone can learn anything else from it. Because if we envision that somehow one or the other side uses nuclear weapons, this is going to lead to anything other than, you know, uh, horror on global scale. I, you know, so that's that's one side of me. So when I when I think about those statements about the kind of warning, um, you know, the, the thought sort of stops. That's what I mean. We cannot really seriously consider uh, NATO engaging Russia on Baltic borders because that seems to directly point into that direction, right, as an obvious solution. Um, on the other hand, yes, we do want to talk about, you know, uh, values and of democracy and impact on our values and uh, and principles more generally, and that seems to kind of be more uh, 
productive and positive way of thinking about it. By positive, I mean that there's something to be said and something to be uh, reached for, right? And some solidarity and some kind of action that can be imagined, a position, um, et cetera. And I'm sort of constantly kind of going between these two complete sort of incapacity to think and reason any further. And then this kind of, you know, uh, reaching for some um, different way of thinking about what might come in terms of democratic principles. I think it's no doubt that uh, whatever the next steps are in this world, that we will deal with issues of democracy, of representation, of uh, pluralistic societies in every single domestic politics uh, to come. And uh, that is sort of, that will not be predetermined about in terms of how the, the war unfolds. I think that is now a given. And we've been seeing that already as a question that's rising for, for a while. And uh, perhaps this has just uh, both energized um, various forces in societies, but also clearly brought that question to many people's minds. Uh, my worry is, however, that given how the current conversation is going, um, and again, my point about, you know, kind of rush to armaments, right, rush to uh, create the higher defense budgets, that that conversation will lead more in favor of, kind of increasingly jingoistic national nationalist, uh, you know, militarized perspectives rather than to actually a more pluralist debate. Uh, that being said, it would be nice to see perhaps that we recognize that this, uh, you know, if we are thinking of this as a global conversation, that, you know, we need to take an eye off of the West perhaps and look at what this conversation looks like in other parts of the world where sense is different about what this means, right? I'm, and, and so that's, that is kind of, I guess, where I'm going to stop. Sorry, but that's a little bit incoherent. Um, no, a lot of this I, I, to be processed as we, we are speaking, yeah. I, no, that wasn't remotely incoherent. I think that was actually right on point. Um, Nina, uh, your final thoughts on this? Well, so a couple of things, uh, you know, about NATO posing threat. Uh, Putin, of course, thinks that NATO poses threat because if NATO is run by the United States and the United States changes regimes uh, for democratic purposes, so if Ukraine is that democracy, that, as Putin says, run by the United States, what would prevent the United States to then go and take Putin out? So he's very much concerned about this, um, obviously. Uh, so in his mind, he needs to do everything to uh, make sure that he doesn't end like Muammar Gaddafi in a ditch or Saddam Hussein being killed. So that's from his perspective. And I think he will. he's ready to go very far to make sure that he's defended this way. A couple of final thoughts, I think it's important. I think Jessica said Ukraine, I mean, that's basically when I watch Kiev being bombed, it's Kiev is the city where I spend a lot of time. And in fact, Nikita Khrushchev brought it up from the ashes after World War II. And so now another Russian leader is bombing it to pieces. That's, that's something that just doesn't even come together in, in thoughts. Um, I think two questions that I have for myself and everybody else, when Putin is gone and he's gonna be gone one day, you know, causing a lot of destruction, but gone, gone. Could Putin is remain? Could this kind of that, uh, that tension between Russia and NATO, Russia in the West, uh, Russia is not, is not recognized as, as a player as everybody thinks that it's always a menacing force. Could that then later on be exactly the same the same scenario. And another one is that I actually think that, I mean, I can't, I'm, I'm afraid to predict anything because I'm wrong, but uh, it seems to me it's one of those moments when empire and the Russian empire can collapse further. And when it collapses further, it's going to be a lot of problem and destruction and blood and horror. And it's going to become possibly as a kind of Balkan scenario because the post, the Gorbachev scenario in 91 is just too nice. It was too lucky. And so how are we prepared for that? Because Everita was describing all these horrors that are happening now in terms of economy, in terms of supply chain, in terms of something. So what's going to happen then? And I think some great minds should be really thinking about that. What's the next step in the post-Putin world? Thank you, Nina. Uh, the post-Putin world is certainly something I think at the forefront of all of our minds, uh, particularly as we see Ukraine gripped by this terrible, terrible war. Um, we are out of time. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists, Nina, Jessica, and Everita for their insight and their passion. 
Um, I also want to thank all the commenters who put stuff into the chat. Uh, this is the start of a really, really wonderful discussion. Uh, it is also my understanding that uh, the graduate programs in international affairs in collaboration with Global Studies and uh, New School for Social Research Politics will be starting a discussion series to continue on uh, to examine issues like that. So thank you all and have a good night. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jessica and Everita and everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.